Nothing disrupts daily routines quite like a winter storm. At their best, they are inconvenient. At their worst, they can be killers. Controlling the impact of winter storms is one of the most important jobs we do in highway operations. So important that the clearing of snow and ice takes priority over all other activities. Our goal is to make the roads as safe as possible as soon as possible. As far as we are concerned, snow and ice control operations are not complete until the pavement is clear and the shoulders are plowed back. So, if we are to accomplish our goals, it is absolutely essential that all snow fighting equipment be in top working order. To that end, a complete inspection is made of every piece of snow fighting equipment at each yard. And to be sure we are ready, this inspection takes place every year, well before the first winter storm. Just as the equipment has to be in top working order, so do you. It is important that you read and strictly adhere to the drug and alcohol policy. An impaired operator of a large truck with a plow can be a dangerous combination. This impressive area is the communication center for District 1. Although this is by far the most elaborate communication center we have, it is important that you understand that all radio transmissions have to go through some type of communication center in each district. For that reason, your radio should be used only when necessary, and all messages should be brief and to the point. Your brief road conditions report also helps us assess the overall response we give to each storm. The information you provide helps us to determine if more or less manpower and equipment is needed. Additionally, we have hired an independent consultant to provide us with the forecast. Through their help, we can dispatch the appropriate number of people and equipment using the best information available. After all, one of the best things we can do to control a storm is to be out there at the right time. Through this introduction, we have covered the first things you need to remember about snow fighting. Keep yourself and your equipment in good condition. Respond to each call as quickly as possible. And keep all radio communication brief and to the point. Of course, there is a great deal involved with each of these points. So in this first program on snow and ice control, we will look at the different types of equipment we use in getting ready for the winter season. We use several types of plows, the reversible, fixed, underbelly, and V-plow. We use two types of spreaders, the hopper box and the tailgate spreader. Let us take a closer look at each, beginning with the plows. The most common type is the reversible plow. As you would guess from its name, this plow can be turned to the left or to the right to allow you to push snow to either side of the road. The second type is a fixed plow. These plows are fixed to push the snow to the right. In some areas, we use an underbelly plow. It is used in conjunction with the plow mounted on the front of the truck and can be very effective when removing snowpack from the roadway. The underbelly plow is located under the center of the truck and like the reversible plow is very versatile in its movements. Finally, there is the V plow. Obviously, this is one huge piece of equipment. And as such, its use is pretty much limited to the severest snowstorms and heaviest drifting situations. Wings are also frequently used in conjunction with a V-plow. The purpose of the wing is to push the snow further away during plowing. Although these plows look quite different from each other, there are a number of similarities among them. To begin with, all plows share some common parts. The biggest part of the plow is referred to as the mowboard. But it is really the blades that do most of the work. At IDOT, we use three types of blades, steel, carbide, or rubber. All plows have one or two blades that extend below the moldboard to protect it from damage. When you are plowing, the blades cut through the snow, often right down to the pavement. As a result, they wear down. But it is a lot less expensive to replace blades than it is to replace a moldboard. The blades are replaced using a two-finger rule, which we will discuss later. Along the top of the moldboard is the deflector. The deflector helps keep the snow from blowing back over the plow, obstructing your vision. All of our plows are hydraulically controlled with one lever. Pull the lever to raise the plow and push the lever to lower the plow. 
For the reversible plow, push the lever to either side to turn the plow from side to side. Because the V-plows and fixed plows do not turn from side to side, the lever is used to control only up and down movements. When the wing is used, however, a great deal more is involved. In fact, plowing with a wing normally requires two operators since there are a number of movements and positions for the wing. So the second operator is responsible for controlling the wing and keeping the driver informed of potential roadside hazards. Operating the wing takes a great deal of practice and concentration. Along with keeping an eye out for roadside hazards, you also have to be sure to keep this bar parallel to the roadway. If the bar is slanted up or down during plowing, the extreme force could damage the truck or plow. Most plows also have a trip mechanism. When the mechanism is set correctly, the plow will trip or fall forward when it strikes a hard object. Raise the plow to reset the trip mechanism. Those are the major parts and features of the types of plows we use. But you should also be familiar with the procedures for hooking and unhooking reversible plows and changing blades. The first thing you should know is that all plows and trucks are slightly different. For that reason, it is best to use the same plow with the same truck. See that the number on the truck matches the number on the plow. It is also best and easiest to have someone guide you toward the plow. Drive slowly, following the spotter's directions until the holes on the mounting frame of the truck match the holes on the plow frame. In some cases, the holes may not line up exactly. Just raise the plow frame slightly until the holes match. Insert the pins through the holes and secure them with the keys. Next, wipe off the fittings on the hydraulic lines to remove any salt or dirt and attach them. And here's a little trick. If you have trouble attaching the lines, carefully press on the end to relieve the pressure. With the new hydraulic systems, you can bleed the lines by rotating the joystick. After you have hooked up the hydraulic lines, attach the plow lift cable to the hook. At this point, you should inspect your work. As the plow is operated, check for jerky movement. Look over the plow lift cable and check for any signs of leaking around the hydraulic lines. Report any problems you find now. Do not risk having problems on the road. V plows and fixed plows are mounted in the same manner. Now let us look at the procedures for disconnecting the plow. The very first thing to do is block the plow. If it is at all possible, use something to keep the plow at a height that will make hooking up the plow easy. Then unhook the hydraulic lines, the plow lift cable, and remove the keys and pins. When you unhook the hydraulic lines, you may have to tap the connection gently to free it. Now before you can disconnect the plow lift cable, you will have to push down the hydraulic lift ram, and it's a good idea to push it all the way down. That way you can reduce the chance of dirt and debris affecting the ram's movement. Sometimes this can be a difficult task, but resist the temptation to stand on the plow frame. You have a much smaller chance of slipping if you are standing on the ground. Finally, have the operator back away and then insert the same pins and keys into the plow frame. That is the best way to keep them from getting lost. We use blades to protect the mow board from wear. So when the blades wear down to within two fingers of the mow board, here is the procedure you should follow to replace them. First, position the plow at a comfortable working height, about a foot off the ground. Then secure both sides of the plow frame. Only now is it safe to begin removing the bolts holding the blade. When you remove the bolts, always leave the bolt at each end in place. Then, when all the middle bolts have been removed, insert a bar or a pin through the blade at each end to hold it in place as the two final bolts are removed. Then carefully remove the blade and place it out of the way. To install the new blade, simply repeat the procedure of inserting a bar or pin through the blade and mow board. Then place the nuts and bolts at each end, being careful not to over tighten them. And it is a good practice to use new nuts and bolts with the new blade. You do not need problems when you are plowing because of worn out rusty bolts. In some districts though, we use two blades. And in some cases, the blades are made of different material. When that is the case, be sure to check with your lead worker to find the right combination of blades 
and correct order to mount them. With that, we covered the three types of plows we use, the basic procedure for operation, hooking and unhooking plows, and the procedures for blade replacement. In the next program, we will look at hopper box and tailgate spreaders. In this program, we will look at the two types of spreaders we use. They are the tailgate and the hopper box spreaders. Let's start with the tailgate spreader. As you would guess from its name, this spreader is mounted below the tailgate of the truck. Inside the spreader is an auger. As the auger turns, it pulls the material to an opening above the spinner. The spinner then spreads the material over the road. Inside the cab, there are two types of control systems for spreaders. Most of the trucks have an automated system manufactured by Dickey John Corporation. The computer, based on the speed of the truck, controls the speed of the spinner, application rate, and turning the spreader on and off. If your truck still has a manual system, you will have two dials in the cab. One dial regulates the speed of the auger, the other dial regulates the speed of the spinner. There is also a lever to turn the spreader's hydraulic system on and off. Use this lever as you need it when you are working. Do not use the PTO clutch switch on the dash. That shuts down the hydraulics for the whole truck, including the plow, and could cause damage to the hydraulic clutch. If you have a newer truck, it will not have a PTO switch. Those are the major components of the tailgate spreader and the controls for operation. Now let's look at the hookup procedure. The normal procedure is to raise the spreader into position making sure the holes will line up evenly on both sides. Then, just insert the pins through the holes and secure them with a clip, and be sure to bolt the braces in place on each side, too. Now the spinner can be connected. Slide the pin through the holes and secure it with a clip, and then attach the brace for the spinner. The brace keeps the spinner level when the dump box is raised. Now the hydraulic lines can be connected. Be sure to hook up each line on the right fitting. If you put the wrong lines on the fittings, your auger will run backward or not at all. And again, always wipe the connections clean. A little debris may be all it takes to follow up the whole hydraulic system. The next step is to attach the spreader shield. The whole purpose of the shield is to keep material from spilling out. The last step is to adjust the chains and the tailgate so that material can flow easily to the auger but be sure that a clearance is maintained between the tailgate and the shield. Otherwise, you will not be able to dump the load or get the shield off if the auger gets jammed. With hookup complete, operate the auger and spinner. Make sure both respond properly and look over the hydraulic lines, checking for leaks. Some types of tailgate spreaders are equipped with a clean-out door. If the auger gets jammed or otherwise blocked, release the latch on each end and open the door. Then you can remove the blockage. But always remember to turn off the power first. Never get near the auger when the hydraulics are engaged. Then check the operation of the dump bed. You will not be able to spread much material if the dump bed does not work. A very important point here is to never raise the dump body all the way when you are working. The average height of the dump body on our smallest truck when fully raised is 15 feet. 
Some bridges and overpasses in Illinois are below that height. Obviously, the truck does not have a chance of going under all bridges. The newer trucks have a warning light to alert the operator that the bed is being raised. The first time you hook up the tailgate spreader each year, you should load it and then check the distribution of material. Let's begin with the proper procedures for loading. Depending on the size of the storm and the policies in your district, you may have to load the truck yourself. If you have to load the truck, come straight in, not at an angle. You want to be sure to get all the material in the truck and always dump from as low a height as possible. When you use the loader a lot, be sure to grease the fittings for the pivot points frequently. And remember to wipe the fittings before attaching the grease gun. With the truck loaded, you are ready to check the distribution of material. This is very important because the distribution of material can change significantly depending on the position and speed of the spinner. On this spreader, the spinner can be positioned in the center, to the right, or to the left. The proper position of the spinner should be discussed with your lead worker and then mount the spinner where it will do the most good for your particular route. Just as the distribution of material is important, so is the amount that is spread. So the spreader must be calibrated. Basically, calibration involves finding out how much material will be applied at various auger settings and then determining the best settings to use. On newer trucks, the Dickey John computer will spread a set amount of salt per lane mile regardless of the speed of the truck. On older trucks without a Dickey John, refer to your snow removal policy book for spreader calibration. That covers the basics of tailgate spreaders. Now let's look at hopper box spreaders. These spreaders are mounted in the dump bed of a truck before the snow season begins and are left in place until winter is over. One of the most common ways to mount the hopper box is to use a loader to raise it, back the truck under the loader, and lower the hopper into position. Although these spreaders are much larger, operation is very similar. Inside the hopper box is a conveyor. The conveyor moves the material through a discharge gate at the back of the spreader and dumps it down the chute where it lands on the spinner. The spinner then spreads the material onto the road. Along with the speed of the spinner, the width of the spread can be adjusted by raising or lowering the deflector shields around the spinner. With a hopper box spreader, one of your biggest concerns is with the discharge gate setting. Once the proper gate opening has been determined, operate the spreader at that setting throughout the season. The only other major difference with a hopper box spreader is the grate covering the hopper. Before and after loading, always remember to clean the grate of large lumps of material to make it easy for the material to pass through the grate. You do not want to risk them falling off and hitting passing vehicles. Be careful of people in the yard too. Look before throwing material off the truck. Our next demonstration shows the proper use of salt, calcium chloride, and our weather forecasting system. Calcium chloride helps salt to work at lower temperatures. Without this chemical, salt is only effective down to temperatures of about 20 degrees. With calcium chloride, salt can be effective at temperatures close to zero. When flakes are used, you should add a bag directly to a load of salt after there is already some salt in the truck. That will allow the chemical to mix in with the entire load. The same holds true when the liquid form is used. The liquid is added to a load of salt and then dumped into the truck. But remember, enhanced materials may not be the best answer in all locations. Check with your supervisor to determine which chemical 
is suitable for your area. Let's start with sodium chloride, a mineral we commonly refer to as salt, rock salt, or road salt. And although it's been around for a long time, salt is still the chemical most used as a freeze point depressant on highways. Salt is stored at IDOT yards in sheds and domes. To store salt, use a loader to move salt into the shed or dome. In some yards, conveyors or other devices are used. Calcium chloride, often referred to as chloride for short, is another chemical commonly used as a freeze point depressant. Calcium chloride is found in natural brines that are pumped from beneath the Earth's surface. It is packaged as pellets or flakes in the dry form or in solutions of various concentrations. Calcium chloride is more expensive than salt, but it is effective at temperatures below zero and is fast acting. Calcium chloride actually generates heat when it dissolves into brine, a very beneficial characteristic. It also draws moisture from the air, providing water for initial brine formation. In addition to taking moisture from the air, calcium chloride also takes moisture from everything else with which it comes into contact. It can destroy a good pair of leather boots or gloves in a hurry. It takes the moisture right out of the leather. When working with calcium chloride, you should always wear protective eyewear, clothing, and rubber boots. IDOT uses various methods to mix calcium chloride with salt. Dry calcium chloride is added to buckets of salt in a front-end loader, then dumped into the trucks. Loads can be wet using a variety of spray systems. Our newest trucks have saddle tanks to carry liquid calcium chloride, which is applied directly to the salt as it leaves the truck. Although sodium chloride and calcium chloride are the most widely used de-icing chemicals, there are a number of others that can be effective in special situations. In addition to being used as a dry material, sodium chloride and calcium chloride are also used in brine. Brine is any solution of chloride and water. Most brine used on Illinois highways is made from a mixture of sodium chloride, rock salt, and water. A brine tank is basically a large container in which the salt and water can be mixed. Some IDOT team sections have pre-manufactured brine making systems. IDOT personnel have built others like this one. An important tool in brine is a hydrometer, which is used to measure the specific gravity of a solution in water. Most team sections use a specialized salt brine hydrometer that converts the specific gravity into a salt concentration reading on a scale from 0 to 100 percent. The ideal concentration of salt in water is 23.7 percent by weight. That equates to a reading of 85 percent. The salt solution concentration is critical in the production of brine because if the concentration is too low or too high, the brine will not do its intended job. Brine is frequently used to pretreat locations such as bridge decks and low-lying areas that may be susceptible to frost. One of the major pieces of equipment that have been brought in as far as technology goes is the Data Transmission Network, or DTN system. It's a non-demand radar system, and inasmuch, its screens are about 15 minutes old when you get them. As you can see, we have on the screen right now a storm that is currently crossing Illinois. The different colors represent various types of precipitation and the amounts of each. Green represents rain, purple, sleet or freezing rain, and blue, snow. The darker area within each color indicates heavier precipitation. We can zoom in on that storm, making use of this technology. We can loop it, which means we can take a look at the motion of a storm or the movement of it. We can zoom in to take a look at it down to a county level to see what's happening. It is very effective in tracking a storm coming into the area. We can take a look at current conditions or at where the jet stream is. This will give us a pretty good idea which way the storm is going to track. We can also take a look at current wind velocity and direction. This is also handy in determining exactly where a high pressure cell is located. We can also view the current weather map to get an idea of where the highs and lows are or what is going to happen in the near future. You may also pull up the IDOT sensor sites from all over Illinois. We also have the availability through our MMIS system to take a look at what is happening in surrounding states so we can track a storm's movement. It's used to determine when we should start getting staff out. 
It's also used to determine how long before a storm is over so we can initiate cleanup operations. It is a very effective tool in developing strategies for handling a storm and when to shut down. Now we'll discuss the ARWIS system. It stands for Roadway Weather Information System. There are numerous sites throughout the state. It senses 17 atmospheric and roadway conditions as well as pavement conditions. Each site is connected by telephone line to its district office in one of the nine districts throughout the state. At each site, it consists of a tower which has wind speed and direction as well as many other aspects for sensing the weather. It has pavement sensors embedded in the pavement and on the bridge decks, which will collect data and transmit that back to that site and back through the telephone lines to each one of the district offices. This particular site we pulled up on our list is I-74 near Galesburg. The first thing we would want to check would be the time of day, the date, and check the time of the last report to see if it is current information. In the far left column, it shows the air temperature and dew point. It shows us a relative humidity, and under precipitation, it shows us a type. Right now, S stands for snow. It could also have an R for rain or N for no precipitation. Many different types of precipitation can be detected. It tells us the rate of precipitation in inches per hour. It shows us accumulation of precipitation since midnight. It also shows the wind's direction, speed, and gust in miles per hour. At this site, there are four sensors embedded in the pavement. Each one of these will give us a temperature of the pavement, and the sensor that is on the approach pavement will also give us a subsurface temperature. The subsurface temperature is approximately 17 inches below the pavement and gives us a relationship between the temperature below the pavement and the surface itself. The status of the pavement at this location is chemical wet, indicating we have applied chemicals to that area. It can show us damp. It can show us wet. The next conditions show a chemical factor, a percent of ice, and the depth of that ice. While DTN and ARWIS provide local information, the department also utilizes consultants for long-range forecast and data analysis. In the next program, we will look at inspecting your equipment. There is one type of person we do not need in the Department of Transportation, and that is a truck driver. Now, this is not a truck driver. This is a truck operator, and there is a big difference. Truck operators do a great deal more than drive. They take care of their equipment. They learn as much as possible about how it works. They are always on the lookout for potential problems, and they correct problems as soon as possible. And that is what this fourth program on snow and ice control is all about. Taking care of the equipment and thoroughly inspecting it for problems. Here in Illinois, we take our equipment and its condition very seriously. As I mentioned in part one of this course, every piece of snow fighting equipment in the state is thoroughly inspected every year before the snow season. And I do mean thoroughly. An inspector will go through a detailed checklist with you, covering every facet of your equipment. From your lights and turn signals to the plow and its condition, through the engine compartment and even under the dump bed. For this check, always make sure the dump bed is properly secured. But the purpose of this inspection is not to find fault with you. The purpose is to ensure that you start the brutal task of snow fighting with the best and safest equipment available. 
And because the inspector is highly knowledgeable, you may even find a few things to help you with the equipment year-round. Of course, truck operators will take a great deal of pride passing the inspection with flying colors. So let us go through the procedure you should follow every day when inspecting your equipment. We call this inspection the circle of safety. The name, of course, comes from the fact that you make a complete circle around the equipment, looking for both obvious and potential problems. Always begin your circle of safety with the engine compartment. Check the oil and make sure it is between the add and full marks. Next, check the fluid level for the radiator. It should be within an inch or so of the filler neck. Make sure you have enough windshield washer fluid, too. For this and all other fluids, be sure to add the right type of fluid. Inspect the condition of the drive belts and pull on them to check for proper tension. Next, see that you have enough brake fluid and enough power steering fluid. When you are satisfied that everything is in good condition, close the hood and make sure the latch is secure. Now look over the tires. Make sure they are in good condition and that all the lug nuts are in place and secure. And remember, the recommended pressure may vary, so check the rating on each tire. Now check the door latches and window cranks. Nothing would be more frustrating than to be in a storm with a window stuck down. Check the fuel at the beginning and end of each day. Do not leave yourself or the next shift with an empty fuel tank. Next, make sure you have enough hydraulic oil. As you continue around the truck, be sure to clean off any dirty lights. They will not do you much good if they cannot be seen. Now, if you are working with a hopper box spreader, take the time to make sure that the deflectors are properly positioned. If your spinner and auger assembly is not a sealed system, you may want to grease the fitting for the spinner assembly. In many cases, it'll be working constantly, so it needs frequent lubrication. You should also be aware that the chain for the conveyor needs lubrication too. On this truck, the reservoir is located here. Finally, always double check the gate setting. As for the tailgate spreaders, the procedure is pretty much the same. Again, if required, grease the chain for the auger as well as the fitting for the auger bearing on the other side. You should also inspect the dump bed to be sure it is free of debris. Now the plow. Look over the condition of the plow lift cable and see that it is secure and it is a good idea to spot check the trip mechanism. These two surfaces have to be parallel for the plow to trip properly. Check hydraulic lines for overall conditions and look for any signs of leaking. And finally, inspect the wear on the blades. Obviously, this is a new blade, but the best way to check the blades is to follow the two-finger rule. The blades should be at least the width of two fingers below the mow board. Finally, it is a good idea to install markers or flags on each end of the plow. This makes it easier for you to see where the end of the plow is. Now you are ready for the in-cab inspections. Get in the habit of using the handholds. Do not grab the steering wheel. Then fasten your seatbelt. Nothing adds more to your safety than the few seconds it takes to buckle up. Take a minute to become familiar with the controls and gauges and their locations. There are some minor differences among the trucks, and this is the time to find out where everything is. With the help of another person, check your headlights, turn signals, emergency lights, horns, and your wipers and washers. Take time to clean off your mirrors. You have to be able to see clearly behind you, too. Then check your taillights, turn signals, backup alarm, and spinner light. The spinner light is absolutely essential for you to monitor the material being spread on the road. Then operate the auger and spinner to see if they respond to the controls. Operate the plow too. Make sure that it is working properly and that all the movements are smooth. If you are using a tailgate spreader, raise and lower the dump bed. You will not be able to spread much material if the dump bed does not work. Okay, you are almost ready to head out, but first, Check your emergency brake and your radio. It may be the only way to contact help if you need it. Your two-way radio can be your most important tool out on the road, especially in case of emergencies. Whenever you get ready to leave the yard, first check to make sure the radio is on and working. You can do that by turning it on and watching for the display or power light to come on. 
or call the office to make sure you can communicate. Also make sure you are on the proper channel. You may talk truck to truck or to the base. Radio range is limited in mobile operation and is normally used only when vehicles are in close proximity. There is radio protocol that you must be aware of and follow at all times. First, do not transmit when someone else is talking on your frequency. Exchange information efficiently and effectively. In other words, think about what you want to say before you get on the air, and then keep your conversation as short as possible. When making calls, key the mic and wait for the tone to clear. Sign on properly by identifying the station you are calling using their ID number, then identify yourself by yard name and number. Speak slowly and clearly. Use proper language and that means no profanity. You never know who may be listening in on your conversation. When someone calls in an emergency, all other radio traffic is to stop until the information is transmitted and acknowledged by the receiving station. An emergency is declared for serious accidents and injuries only. When receiving calls, acknowledge calls as quickly as possible by identifying your station. When communicating on the radio, you must use 10 codes. The purpose of 10 codes is to shorten the conversation. The most common 10 codes are 10-4, I received your transmission and understand what you said. 10-7, out of service. 10-8, back in service. 10-9, I didn't hear you or understand your message, please repeat. 10-13, road and weather conditions. 10-19, return to yard. 1020 is code for what is your location. 1046, disabled vehicle. 1050, accident. It is very important to use the 107 code. If you don't and someone tries to reach you on the radio, they may worry that something has happened to you. When your conversation is complete, sign off properly by identifying your number. Finally, make sure you have all the supplies you need. A first aid kit, fuses, fire extinguisher and reflector kit. And for those long shifts, take along something to eat. And that is the circle of safety, except for this. When you find a problem that you cannot correct yourself, report it. Do not leave an unpleasant surprise for someone else. With your equipment in top working condition, you are ready for a dry run. So first, take a few minutes to learn your route. Your lead worker will go over the exact areas that you will be responsible for, as well as pointing out areas to pay special attention to. As you drive along your route, be on the lookout for raised manholes and other obstacles that could present problems. And when you find them, it is a good idea to mark them so you know where they are when they are covered with snow. Expansion joints in bridge decks can cause problems too. As you can see, the joint is skewed across the deck at about the same angle as your plow. You will need to remember to raise the plow at these locations too. Selecting your snow plowing wardrobe may seem like a trivial issue, and it may be until you get caught out that first time in a howling snowstorm with equipment problems. It is then that the clothing you are wearing becomes a vital issue. Maximum protection with minimum layers is ideal. Start your shift with clean, dry skin and clean clothing. Silk or a synthetic such as polypropylene are best next to your skin. Polypropylene is a good choice because it wicks moisture away from your skin. Avoid cotton as it tends to hold moisture. Over that, wear two-piece style long underwear of either thermal material or wool. On your feet, wear liners or polypropylene socks as the first layer. A good choice for a second layer is wool socks. Do not wear stretch socks because they tend to cut off blood circulation, and it's good circulation that keeps your feet warm. As for trousers, jeans are okay, but your best bet is quilt lined trousers or those made of thermal material. Suspenders are better than a belt because, again, they allow for more air circulation. When you pick out shirts, Think in terms of layers because loose-fitting layers of clothing trap air to help keep you warm. Over your undershirt, a wool or polar fleece polyester shirt is a good choice. Pick out shirts with long tails so they don't work when you get in and out of the truck and leave bare skin exposed. 
A heavy sweatshirt of fleece or any type of polar tech type fabrics with a hood makes a good third layer. Final protection over your shirts and pants depends on the severity of the weather. The best outer layer is one that is both windproof and waterproof, yet breathable to allow moisture to escape. Gore-Tex or a nylon laminate that has been windproofed are good examples. Steel-toed footwear must be worn at all times. Rubber bottom, leather top boots with liners are probably best. Oiled leather boots with non-skid soles and liners are good also. Buckle-type rubber boots do a good job of keeping your shoes dry, but they don't breathe, which can cause your feet to sweat. Then when you get out of the truck, your feet get cold very rapidly. A knit wool cap under a snug-fitting hood is good protection for your head. Also have a ski mask to put on just in case you have to get out of the truck in a severe storm. Cold, dry winds can freeze your face in a matter of minutes. Mittens are generally better insulators than gloves, but limit the use of your fingers. So it's a good idea to carry both a pair of thermal gloves and a pair of mittens. Both can be used depending on what you are doing. Because of going through the circle of safety, learning your route, wearing the proper clothing, and making a dry run, you should be confident that both you and your equipment will be ready when the first storm hits. Here in Snow and Ice Control Part 5, we will look at some plowing and spreading techniques. The two universal rules for plowing and spreading are, one, go slower than you normally would, and two, give yourself plenty of room to stop and turn. That is because plowing snow and spreading material is a lot different from normal driving. Just think of the conditions you face. First, there is the condition of the road itself. You would not be out there at all if it were not for the fact that the roads are not safe for normal driving. Then there is the visibility factor. When the snow is falling and the wind is blowing, it is hard enough to see the road, let alone plow it. Keep in mind that much of the time you spend fighting the storm will be in the middle of the night. You may have driven this road for years, but it sure looks different now. And let's not forget the public. You can bet you will see people on the road who obviously do not know the first thing about driving on snow and ice. When you put a plow and a spreader on your truck, you change the whole nature of the machine. Because of the added weights of the plow, spreader, and material, use a lower transmission gear and anticipate the need to slow down and stop your truck. With the added length and width of the plow, increase the amount of room you need to maneuver safely. When stopping, be sure to allow for the added length of the plow to avoid obstructing traffic. Just plowing straight ahead is a challenge. As you are pushing the snow, it is pushing right back. You may have to oversteer slightly to counteract that pushing force. And that is just the driving part. You will also have to decide where and when to spread material and how and when to adjust the plow. You will have to report on the condition of your route all the while keeping your eyes on traffic and looking out for disabled vehicles. Consult your supervisor for the policy on assisting motorists. Remember to use the six pavement codes. Code 1, all clear. Code 2, scattered. Code 3, 75% bare.
Code 4, 50% bear. Code 5, 25% bear. Code 6, 100% snow packed and ice covered. If you have a tailgate spreader, you will also have to remember to raise and lower the dump bed to spread material and to avoid overhead obstructions. So when you were called out to fight a storm, be sure you are well rested and ready to devote your full attention to the job at hand. With that in mind, let's look at some of the types of storms you are likely to face and the procedures to follow for clearing various types of roads. The first thing you should know is that no two storms are exactly alike. When the temperature is near freezing, you will encounter everything from heavy wet snow to ice storms and every possible mixture in between. When it is extremely cold, the snow is more apt to be very dry and you are more likely to encounter drifting conditions. Of course, you can expect anywhere from a few inches of accumulation to well over a foot in a matter of hours. You need to be aware of these types of storms because they call for different actions on your part and in many cases even different equipment. As a rule, your lead worker will give you instructions on how to fight each storm, but here are some guidelines you should be aware of. First, do not apply material if the snow is dry and blowing across the road. Here spreading material will only make the situation worse because it will hold the snow on the road. Second, if the snow is wet, spread material as soon as the pavement is barely white. For those of you using abrasives, this will help provide traction at the outset of the storm. And for those of you using salt, spreading material early will create brine that will turn the snow to slush. Third, be on the lookout for potentially hazardous conditions. Glaze and ice should always be treated as soon as you spot them. Bridge decks can also be hazardous. As you know, untreated bridge decks freeze more quickly than other road surfaces, especially when they span water. Pre-treatment of bridge decks will prevent them from icing. If bridges are not pre-treated, special care will be necessary. Curves also require special consideration. For curves to the left, get over close to the shoulder. And for curves to the right, stay close to the center of the road so you can apply material over the middle of the pavement. By applying material to the high side in both directions, the movement of traffic will help distribute material over the entire road. One more point about spreading material. Be sure to apply a significant amount of material to the approach before crossing railroad tracks. Now let us look at plowing. The very first thing to remember is that there are obstructions on your route. Railroad tracks, expansion joints, raised pavement markings, and so on. Be prepared to raise the plow or otherwise avoid these obstructions. With that in mind, let's look at clearing different types of roads, beginning with two-lane roads. The procedure here is relatively simple if there is not too much accumulation. Just begin at the center of the road and push the snow to the right. Next, plow the other lane, picking up where you left off with the first pass. Then continue making passes until you have cleared the driving lanes and the shoulders. Words of caution, many shoulders are gravel, so raise the plow slightly to avoid scraping the gravel off the shoulders. Blizzards can require some extra equipment for this or any other type of road, from snow blowers to graders or V-plows. Snow blowers and V-plows are reserved for the heaviest snowfall. Blowers are especially useful in widening the traveled way when a wall of snow has accumulated at the edge of the pavement. V-plows can also be used to widen the traveled way, but they are the best tools we have to open a road closed by heavy accumulations and drifting. The best way to clear a closed road is to plow to one side, then the other, then straight in until you break all the way through. Graders may well be our most versatile piece of snow fighting equipment. With a V and wing attachment, the grader can clear just about anything. The important thing to keep in mind when trying to clear a great deal of snow is that you do not need to clear it all in one pass. As you can see here, this operator is pushing the snow off the road with a plow while winging back the shoulder. But notice that the wing is well above ground level. That avoids putting undue stress on the wing and at the same time provides additional clearance for the next plowing pass. Now with the next pass, 
the shoulder is plowed back and the wing is again used to provide more clearance. After heavy storms, snow packed like this is frequently left behind. When the temperature remains well below freezing, there are several ways to remove the snow pack. Chemicals, graders, and underbelly plows are all very effective. Now the procedure for plowing multi-lane roads. The exact method you use to clear a multi-lane highway will depend on factors such as the equipment available, the number of lanes, the traffic volume, and the amount of snow and ice on the road. For a four-lane highway, one method is to plow in tandem with another unit. The lead truck plows the left lane and pushes the snow off to the left shoulder. The following truck plows the right lane, pushing the snow to the right. The plow in the right lane should overlap the pass made by the first unit to remove any windrow snow left between the lanes. The procedure is then repeated on the other side of the road. The first truck clears the left lane, pushing the snow to the left. The second unit follows overlapping the first pass and pushing the snow to the right. The driver of the second truck should stay far enough behind the first unit to allow for the safe operation of vehicles trying to pass. Of course, you will need to make additional passes to widen the road completely. This procedure is especially beneficial when the tailgate spreader is mounted on the driver's side of the truck. On highways with three lanes on each side, the procedure is a little different. The lead truck makes the first pass down the left lane, plowing the snow to the left. The second unit follows down the middle lane where it can pick up the snow pushed over by the first truck and carry it over to the right lane. The third truck clears the right lane by pushing the snow to the right and over to the shoulder. Of course, not all roads have wide medians. So when you have to plow where a barrier separates the lanes, the first truck should start at the barrier and push the snow to your right. The following plow should pick up the windrow from the first truck and also push snow to the right. Again, it will take additional passes to completely clear the road. You will also have to take care of ramps in gore areas on multi-lane roads. When plowing ramps, you should always work from the high side to the low side. With gore areas, the whole idea is to carry the snow past the gore, depositing it on the shoulder. To do that, turn the plow straight as you go by, and then angle the plow to the right after you have passed the gore. The reason for this is that snow piled in the gore area can freeze and become a blunt hazard. Urban areas pose unique challenges because a median area normally does not separate the traffic. Here, the two things to keep in mind are first, push the snow to the right, and second, clear the driving lanes first. After the driving lanes are clear, you can begin clearing the turn bays. For single lane turn bays, carry snow through the intersection and then continue in the new direction, allowing traffic to take care of the wind row that remains. This procedure applies for two lane turn bays as well when plowing in tandem. Many of our urban areas also have turn only lanes. For these situations, the lead truck should begin at the far edge of the turn only lane and both plows should push the snow to the right. And remember, your work is not done until you have completely cleared the travel way. The additional passes you make are important for three reasons. First, the wider the travel path, the safer the road. Second, pushing the snow back from the edge gives you somewhere to put new snow if you should get another storm. The third reason is drainage. By pushing snow completely off the road, you lessen the chance of melting snow running back over the road where it could refreeze and create conditions more hazardous than the storm itself. There is a lot more to snow and ice control than we can cover in this program, but there are a few things you can do that will apply in all situations. First, make sure the equipment you are using is in good shape and properly equipped to do the job. When you are out driving in the middle of a snowstorm, you have enough to worry about without wondering if your equipment will make it through your shift. Second, wear your seatbelt. Nothing adds more to your safety than the few seconds it takes to buckle up. Third, operate at a speed that is consistent with the road, the traffic, and the weather conditions. Use a transmission gear that will help you control your speed without having to use the brakes as often. Fourth, stay on your route and stay in touch. 
If you have to change your route for any reason, call your lead worker. The people in the office should know where you are at all times. Finally, stay calm. Anger and panic cloud judgment. Thank you.